we'll go just like always we'll go to our points um so our major points uh to look for So major points to think about with Farah. Um, now a lot of people will probably be probably be like, well, Farah like major points. Well, Farah is just all about like spamming and like spamming squishies and you know playing in the air, you know fuel management that kind of stuff. There's a little bit more to Farah I would say than that, but there are some good points in there from the basic knowledge that most people have about Farah. I'm gonna expand upon it just a tiny little bit more. So overall. What are some key points that we got to look at as fair? Okay, well, the number, the first point that's pretty obvious is you got to manage your time in the air. Um, so this is goes to fuel management and stuff like that. Time in air. So I call this the third, um, third dimension a lot of the times. Um, and what I mean by that, and I'll give like, a small small little thought process behind like what I think about with this and why I call it like third dimension um, technically I can call it like the third plane as well I'm a math geek as you guys can probably tell like just a tiny little bit of math geek so I try to apply like obviously stuff that I always learn in real life and everything like that to here so something that I tell my fair players all the time is looking at the map just like how it is right now right we look at most people look at overwatch in two planes or two dimensions you have can't really draw straight but you got this right so this is the y-axis and you have the x-axis on the side here right so up and down left to right but how about how about like or sorry for, we'll do it like this instead of up and down we'll do forwards and backwards left and right right so forwards and backwards, left and right, okay? So we look at it in a two-dimensional plane a lot of the time because very few characters can go in the air uh, or can hold like high grounds like this, etc. right? So then the other one, and obviously I'm really bad at drawing third dimension, but we'll try our best, okay? Not really a straight line, but it works. This is Z. That's the Z plane, which Z plane is up and down, right? Technically, it's how you utilize um, mathematic equations for like x, y, z. Um, it's length, width, height, um, depth. So like this is like depth, like up and down, like how high are you in the air? How far are you into the ground potentially? Here, you're, you can't go into the ground. So realistically, it's how high in the air are you from the ground? Um, and it's really important on Farah that you understand this. And a lot of the time people will say, oh, it's in the air, like you're always flying. But it's not true. On Farah, you're not flying all the time, right? Sometimes you might just hold this little area over here and spam from here, right? Sometimes you'll maybe hold the high ground over here and then go in the air, right? So managing time in air for me isn't just about flying. It's about managing your time in this third dimension, uh, in this third plane of existence in Overwatch. And like I said, this is like the logical and mathematical side of looking at Overwatch. I broke it down into mathematical terms, which I am sure everyone should be able to understand to a good capacity, at least in my eyes. Um, and just going up and down. How do you how do you manage being up in the air as much as possible? How possible, right? So, next point to kind of bring up into that from there. All right, next point comes into our positioning. So I, I say positioning, and I know positioning is a very neutral term in this game. I don't know why I can't like write words. Position. Ming. All right. So specifically what I mean from here is positioning doesn't just mean, well, how, how where are you? It, in the game, like, are you close, are you far? What I mean by positioning is I mainly take certain concepts that we try to apply all the time, right? Uh, one of the big ones is obviously terrain. And on Fera, terrain will be a big point of view we kind of talk about here. Uh, terrain manipulation, or in more simpler terms, utilizing terrain to reduce your hitbox is 
very important on Farah. Uh, just because you can become such a high high target or easy target to shoot in the air if they have a hit scan, right? Um, in terms of what's next, well, there's two other points, right? Or three other points, I would say. So playing in the skybox is another one, right? In some maps, it has such a high skybox that even if you are in the open, it's really hard to shoot you because you're so high up, right? So playing in the skybox is a pretty big thing as well. And the last thing I would probably honestly argue for, aside from playing in the skybox, right, is closeness. How close are you to a target, right? <clears throat> if you have no threats to you, right, or it's in the middle of the fight and chaos is happening and people are fighting, you should be looking to close the distance on people so that you can hit directs a lot easier. If you can hit directs a lot easier, that makes your job as fair really, really simple, right? That's why you see Ferris hold chokes a lot of the time if they can reduce their hitbox really well. That's why you see Ferris start playing range and then try to close distance onto people so that they can hit the directs more easily. But they again, they, they assess their threats a lot of the time. So it's something that we'll see a little bit more with Jimmu as well. Um, next thing that we're going to talk about is a little bit of a smaller one, but I still think it's pretty important. Target selection. Yes, very important. Remember how I talked about everyone is always says, ah, squishies, squishies, squishies. Squishies are important. Squishies are good. Um, you're, they're not wrong. Squishies are very good to shoot at. But you need to also understand what are you trying to accomplish with your Pharaoh, right? What do you want to do? And most of the time, what it breaks down to at the start of fights, at least, or what your priority is of shooting, it's usually tanks versus squishies. And squishies can be anything from DPS to supports, anyone that has a low HP bar. Uh, why did I put tanks instead of like large HP bar or something? Because pretty much the only people that have very large HP bars are the tanks themselves, right? Um, it's not defined towards roles. So we'll talk about more in detail. Why, why would you ever want to shoot a tank anyways? Um, what does that really accomplish? Once you guys kind of understand the point, um, it'll be very interesting to kind of dive through and go through that sort of stuff. And you guys will find that a little bit of an interesting topic. The last thing I'm going to talk about is specifically timing. So this is an also a very important part of Ferris kit here. Whoa, that does not look like a good M. That looks like a really crappy M. I also want to make sure that I'm not... Whoop. I'm not writing stuff where you can't see. Target selection, I am writing stuff where you can't see. My cam is too big. How to move you down a bit. Okay. That works, I think. Well, rope. There we go. Just got to make sure that I'm very careful about how much timing. Yeah, I'm just going to move timing somewhere else. We're gonna move timing to over here. Man, this is blue. I can't do this. I'm gonna move this over here so I can have a little bit more space. Do you know what? Screw this. I gotta find a wall. Where's a wall? There is a wall. There we go. Okay. Okay. That looks much better. Holy cow, I'm so smart, guys. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like I said, the last one is timing. Um, specifically, what with timing? It's understanding when we need to be aggro versus passive. Aggro versus passive. Now, why is this a super important concept to Sphera? Well, the reason this is a very important concept to Sphera is because if you try to go aggressive at the wrong time, right, Cl try to have a close distance so you can hit more directs and such, well, you go at the wrong time, you're just going to die. <laughs> you go before the dive, potentially you'll die because none of the aggro is uh, on your team. All the aggro is on you, right? So it's about juggling that aggro properly, and that's why timing is so important. Most of the time, timing comes down to Aggro, pressure, pressure, presence, right? 
Um, and that's why you need to understand when should I just play passive, move up to a, a position that can pressure them more, but it's still a fairly passive position where I won't be able to die or I won't be able to get a lot of damage or focus onto me. And then aggression just comes down to, well, when can I go aggro based off of advantages and numbers that we have, or if not advantages and numbers that we have, when we're fighting and no one's even thinking about me going that second third tempo right so the tempo and timing is very very important so these are the four points we're going to really focus on on pharah today uh we're going to look at Jim, like i said jimmy's pov a little bit here and we'll keep these kind of points in mind as we go on so let's uh we'll, we'll just do it like this put that away for now we'll go to jimmy's pov and let's uh watch a little bit of pharah I'm gonna also do this. I don't think it always. I have to find a way to where I can consistently set it like that because it it doesn't do that ever. All right. Jinmu POV time. We see a lot of just spam in general directions that we see them coming from. Again, you see with his fuel every single time he's in the air. He's always kind of just resting when he feels like his fuel is too low, right? And he just has like full supremacy because they, on the side of Glads, I forgot to kind of bring this up as we were going in, but on the side, side of Glads, Glads have no real counter to Jinmu, right? They don't have a hit scan, they don't have anything like that. Uh, so realistically, the big thing comes down to, hey, I can be this aggressive, right? Like going back to these points, right? Remember I said positioning, closeness, timing, aggro. He can go aggro very often as long as he knows that the D.Va has no shift, right? If D.Va has shift, that means he can get flown at potentially. So he has to play a little bit more passive, but he can play and close the distance quite frequently against these guys, right? One of the main things that he just has to be careful for again is that D.Va, right? The rest of the enemy team can't really touch him, right? So he can play that super aggro. Look at this. What an insane sleep by Shu. Oh my goodness. Okay, we'll, we'll kind of slow it down here. So see, we'll kind of back it up a little bit. All right. Right here is what I want us to pay attention to. See how he's pretty much just spamming general direction? He's spamming just to get a little bit of damage down, put some pressure down, right? Like I said. Over here, you always see him when he's low fuel. He, he manages it, right? But he he's always playing in an area where he can fall off and play towards a high ground if required, right? Right now, he's very low fuel. He has boost in three seconds though, so he should be able to maintain his um, air time right now, right? But this is the perfect timing, right? As they're going, he's spamming the tanks before they walk in. This is what I mean by target selection is a, quite an interesting thing. Um, and I'll let you guys kind of see it a little bit more in action before I go into more detail of why it's a very interesting. But he's spamming the tanks at first, right? And then as they walk out, he looks to prioritize and see if there's anybody else he should be shooting. He is mainly looking to trade now at this point, which is really good. He sees skewed and he just hovers above and he's looking to shoot skewed. Then he goes back and they, he sees that they're all grouped up together. Now he's just looking to pretty much peel by shooting everyone that's kind of grouped up together. He gets a great rocket on the skewed. He's shooting pretty much the tanks there, right? And this is when he goes forward to try to just clean up these kills, yeah? You see him playing not fully close, but relatively close enough to where he should be able to hit rockets, no problem, right? Again, like I said, this leads to Shu being in a very good position to sleep him and again insane sleep by Shu but you see how he isn't scared to go this aggressive and abuse uh glides the fact that he doesn't have a full counter to him right no hit scan no nothing he just has that diva and diva has to focus on keeping the winston alive in these dives right because she is a very big part of these dives so now we see jinmu coming back so already right away we already saw multiple of the points kind of brought to light here Bum, 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 bum. Okay, let's see here. Okay, let's go back here. Okay. 
All right. So we see that he doesn't have time to set up closer, right? So he's setting up more so towards the lighthouse because he sees that they're already coming in. Again, you look at where he's looking to spam. He's seeing if there's any squishies nearby, like in a really awkward position. If not, he's going to set up a little bit closer, right? Creepy tanks off. And the big thing that I would say in this fight, this is a, a good example of a fight where it's Jinmu is trying to get in, himself in the best position, but he does not get himself in the best position. Actually, his value at the start, right? If you look at it here, right? This is the cruddy part about Pharah sometimes when you aren't able to set up properly, right? We look at this, he's spamming. He's not getting the most efficient spam in right now, right? And right now, during this downtime, this is the time that Glads have a chance to kind of go for a dive, and that's when they do go for a dive. And if you look at their HP bars, they're very high HP, right? And now Jimmu is in a, a weird position where, well, what do I do here, right? He sees the guys here that are went in for the dive, and he's thinking, okay, well, I should be kind of going in and trying to get as much damage down to them closest distance so I can try to kill them, right? Or do a, a lot of direct damage. Again, you see him hovering around this high ground, but it comes back down to a point where it's... Hunters, Jinmu wasn't in a good position at the start to do a lot of spam damage, right? And you saw what ended up happening with the dive there. Since he wasn't in a good position for it, he's unable to... Uh, he's unable to delay the Glad's dive or force them to be... Not likely to go for the dive, I guess is the best way of kind of putting it. So now it's round three for Jinmu here. See what ends up happening here. So he goes towards the right side, separate from his team. He wants to try to get a little bit of spam. You see that consistently he's still playing in the air. He's playing by some sort of train if he needs to utilize it. Conks forward. Alright. Setting up for this barrage. You see space is kind of mirroring him, so he's just playing the air right now. He's monkey there, he sees supports. Space is there, he uses shift and he uses the M. He sees that it's Base is known where nearby. Again, he's just looking to con consistently, ooh, consistently try to, to either one go for assassination attempts onto the back line, or he's trying to consistently pressure a tank, right? Delay them from potentially being able to go for a dive, and then take a little bit more space. And again, Jinmu, Jinmu is doing a great job of just consistently staying alive, consistently keeping that pressure up, right? And then changing his targets accordingly to what he feels like he can do. Because remember, Space, I did say Space wants to be a part of these dives, but Space doesn't want to be a part of the dives all the time. When they have Space, he does not need to be a part of the dive. He needs to be mirroring Jinmu so that his team or his backline specifically can survive, right? Remember, no hit scans. So that means Space has to play very much double duty, protect the dive and at the same time protect his backline. But when they have space, it's more likely space would look to have space, space. Uh, when they have more control, space will play more around his backline. So again, we see Jinmu now go towards this upside again. Dive goes through. And we see he's consistently like looking. Like you see, he's looking to see if he can go to the backline if they walked up. The backline did not walk up, so he focuses a little bit more on the monkey first, and then he's looking to walk forward. Again, he's playing close to terrain. You see, he's not abusing the wide open area because he's a little bit worried that if he does, even though he has no counter, potentially Diva can shift onto him. Potentially Shu might be shooting some shots because we've seen so far not just space, but Shu has taken some shots on him as well, right? So it has been a consistent kind of trend of. Just him changing targets, maintaining that being in a third kind of plane of existence or third dimension, being in the air as often as possible. And here we see him just zoning. Like, he's just zoning that soldier and he's coming back to the fight here. Still has this barrage online. Still have not seen this barrage from Jinmu yet, right? He's been very, very patient with it. Most of the times, the fights have either gone on... Uh, to a point where he's been consistently mirrored by space so he cannot go for that barrage play or the team has won the fight so fast that he hasn't even had the opportunity or the ability to utilize barrage i'd like to see him use the barrage here and have his team kind of pressure space a little bit more to give jinmu that opportunity but let's see what ends up happening here 
Again, he's he's poking out space. Space is like the closest person here, right? He shoots a few rockets to Kev. Now Monkey's towards in the back. He looks to peel the Monkey. Primal gets forced. Now he's trying to exert a little bit of pressure forward. He doesn't want to peel for the Monkey anymore. He just wants to look to kind of apply pressure to the rest of the core. Because the Monkey isn't as big of a target as before. See Shu? Instant barrage assassination. Shu looks like he didn't even know what hit him there. And from here, he looks to kind of play around his team. He's not looking to go for any aggressive trades or anything like that, right? Great concuss as well from Jinmu there to boop off that diva. Now, something that I, I will say a little bit more that is super interesting to look at with Jinmu's play is he's been using those concusses in very interesting positions. And what I mean by that is if you think about the last few fights that we've seen Jinmu playing this Pharah, he's used this concuss a lot of the times to position enemy players in very poor locations, right? Or to keep them in a specific location. Either to allow him to hit the next rocket he has in a much easier way, or he's looking to utilize that concuss to kind of create some distance between him and the enemy character that is around him, right? So most of the time we see concuss used in a way where it's more so of a movement kind of ability, closing distance, uh, booping away so that, again, like I said, you create some distance between you and a specific character. Uh, most of the time he's been using it to create distance from him and a character or contain a character or a hero in a specific location for a longer period of time. So it's been very interesting to see that. So from there, he doesn't play any fair after that, but... Um, yeah, that's kind of Farah on a little bit of a cough. Now we're going to look at Farah in terms of elsewhere. We're going to look at it in a little bit more of an open map here. So again, a big point that I kind of want to bring up, going back to these things. Uh, let's go in. Yeah, let's go in here and like let's look at it a little bit more. A big part of Jinmu so far that we've seen him do really well positioning. Consistently, again, he's playing around terrain. Even though he didn't have large threats to him, he consistently played around that terrain. He position, he consistently, when he wasn't in danger, went for aggressive timing, or he tried to close the distance on people, right? And then this timing of aggression, you always saw when they utilized a lot of the resources there with the dive and jumped onto his team. That's when he looked to go aggressive because he felt like he had the ability to, based off of less no abilities, really being able to punish him, right? And then target selection, right? He He's not consistently squ shooting those squishies like a lot of people kind of say, oh yeah, Farron used to shoot squishies. He's kind of changing it up. He's shooting tanks sometimes, shooting squishies sometimes. When is he doing what more consistently? Most of the time, actually, if you notice, he's shooting, or he was shooting the tanks on the rotations a lot, and he was shooting the squishies as they were already committed to the dive, right? Sometimes he would peel the tanks, right? But most of the time, it was very much so. He would focus on tanks first and then squishies later. And then obviously maintaining uh, time in the air. He was playing that third dimension, that Zed plane very, very well, playing up and down consistently playing on uh, high ground if he needed to rest his fuel or reset his fuel. Again, very, very good from Jinmu there. All this time I thought your username was sword fighting. It was flighting. <laughs> yeah, it was, um, yeah, I, I hear that a lot of all, honestly, not going to lie. Um, I feel like, I feel like I've tricked quite a few people <laughs> with my username. <laughs> But yeah, it is, it's uh, it's supposed to be sort of lightning, and then I messed it up, and it's like this weird thing of sort of lighting. So then I, I kind of just like have some people say flighting and fighting, and honestly, I it doesn't matter to me what you want to, what if you want to call me, it is what it is. Uh, it's like a super old username anyways, so if you want to call me sort of fighting, uh, or sort of fighting, I'm 100% uh happy for that <laughs> uh, I was gonna take a nap but fuck that sort of streaming thanks Venom nice to see you in the chat bro make sure you take care of yourself though if you need to take a nap you take a nap man you can always lurk in the stream always happy to have lurkers as well so Jinmu Fera. so we're not gonna see it on attack here we're gonna go to defense here specifically, and we're gonna talk about a few things on defense here. All right, let's go to that Jinmu POV. The POV we love to see. 
All right. Okay. We've seen a lot of Jinmu Farah here, but obviously we know Jinmu doesn't only just play Farah, he plays other characters too. Why are we playing Farah here? Well, this is why I want to very much wholeheartedly just drill this point, this specific point into you guys today. This is much more important than you really think. Terrain is one of the best friends of Pharaohs when they're in the air. Because remember, when you're in the air, right, aside from being in a skybox where it's very hard to hit you, it's very nice to have terrain to play around as Pharaoh. Why? Because you can utilize it as kind of movement, like you can use it to kind of fall off, or you can use it as a way to kind of reduce yourself from potentially taking any sort of damage. And the third way you can utilize terrain, right, is you can utilize terrain in a way where you sneak up on people too, right? So there's a lot of different ways that you can utilize terrain in your advantage as Pharah. But the big thing is terrain is so important because it consistently allows you to stay in a specific presence, right? Imagine you're Pharah and you're in a very open air area, right? And you're consistently always just in the air, right? Above the enemy team, around the enemy team where they can see you. You have a hitbox that is always 360 degrees and never reduced. Well, it's just like I kind of talked about before when we talked about Wrecking Ball, when we talked about Tracer in these one-on-ones. If you're noticing, there's a trend with all these characters. I'm never ever saying, yeah, play in the open. Yeah, don't don't think about redu not reducing your hitbox, right? Like, Don't play anywhere where... You don't create a little bit of distance. I'm always talking about terrain. I'm always talking about reducing your hitbox. This is so important to do. If you do not, you're always putting yourself in a disadvantageous position because you're leaving yourself open to so many angles, right? You never want to leave yourself open to so many angles. Even if the threats to you are very little, it's still very important to make sure that you are playing in areas where you can reduce your hitbox. Maybe not as much if there's less threats to you, but still a decent amount, right? And again, like I said, those that terrain will also kind of have a good difference. The other thing to keep in mind with this map, aside from the terrain, uh, you have a giant choke in front of you. <laughs> that is very, very good for you as Pharah. So you can consistently spam that and make it a little bit harder for them to kind of go in. You can set up a kill box in that kind of terrain, that, or that choke, sorry, specifically, that Jinmu is looking at as well. If you set up at that choke and you consistently look to go for a very aggressive place, that can work very well in your favor too. Do I know what Hunters are going to do here? Uh, I'm not fully sure. So we'll see what ends up happening. So we see Jinmu starting towards this right side, and then he kind of is looking more towards this middle so you can see if he can get some scouting done. Right? Leave is on the Sombra as well to kind of see what comps are going. They see an instant swap. I expect Jinmu to hover this right side utterly and completely, right? All right. So he knows now that they're on that right, so I expect him to play the red roof. So you see that he is playing the red roof. Now that they have a McCree, he has to kind of hug this terrain a little bit more. And you see that he's popping off shots, but he's always in a range where he, he will be around that terrain if he needs to, right? And this is perfect. He's manipulating his hitbox, so he's always in a position, right? So that he can come back, get enough healing from the pocket, then peek again. So he's consistently going for these peaks. Great kind of engagement there from Gaga. Sets up the rocket perfectly for fits oh they kind of messed up that sleep timing there but it's okay but you see he's not he's playing a little bit more aggressive now even though there's a pharah in his face he knows that he can play a little bit more aggressive because his team has the advantage in terms of numbers and as well as pharah can't deal with multiple threats like right she can deal with maybe jinmu a little bit but not completely on his own or yeah on his own so at that point jinmu just needs to be careful that he doesn't Pretty much just run into a diva, but he's playing in a respectable range side. If she has no matrix, he can look to kill her potentially. Already has the barrage, consistently playing that right roof to reduce your terrain or your hitbox, sorry. Uh, and he's consistently playing it so that he could go do stuff like this too. Remember how I talked about utilizing that terrain is a very, very good thing because it allows you to go for those assassination plays or aggressive plays because you can just use it as ways to hide yourself right hide your presence he does that completely and then he's able to kill pretty much one support and pressure the other support to move in a less favorable position right and that splits up soul's team major heal is down now jinmu gets to kind of move around the map how he wants kills fits i expect him to still go forward and just go very aggressively onto this team since they're impeded he is playing quite aggressively. Again, he knows that he doesn't have any real threats to him right now. No D.Va on the field, no 
McCree on the field. So he, you see, he's playing a little bit more aggressive. He's consistently looking back to see if he can go for an aggressive play onto Creative with his Conk. He sees that he can't, so he backs up. Now he's going to just play this blue roof area, right? And he's just going to look to spam until Hunters are ready to go for another engagement. You see they're ready to go for engagement. He used the Conk to close a little bit of distance to be a little bit closer. Now he's going to look to play a little bit more aggressive here if he can. 2U is just delaying Jimmu. Jimmu tries to go for the boop off. Unable to do it. But again, he's playing in a s situation where he got zoned. He was able to survive from potentially getting flown at. And now it's just all about, okay, he's utilizing this right side again. And now he sees that McCree isn't anywhere close to him, so he can look to pressure a little bit more, right? Oh, Jimmu. Just gonna pop up a few rockets here, okay. Again. Consistently, consistently, always, always looking to play that terrain. I don't know if I agree with that barrage, though, Jimmu. That was a little bit of a very... <laughs> That was a skeptical barrage for sure. He's gonna start to move forward here now a little bit more because he has the nano too. So he's not as scared about things with nano. Should I? Should he be scared? He should have been scared there because the D.Va is also nano. So when D.Va is nano, she can 1v1 a Farah even if she has pocket, even if she has nano, especially in a very close area like that. If Jinmu had barrage, I could potentially see him going for aggressive plays like that still, but Based off of what was happening there, he tried, it looked like he tried to get a little bit of redemption for himself and it didn't end up working out. So, how he kind of closes the distance and how he kind of cleans up some of these fights as Farah, a little bit less ideal, I would say. But how he starts these fights all the time as Farah is so well done by him, right? He's consistently playing in positions that are very good for him, where he can't get punished as much, right? Again, he's closing this distance because he knows he can. Fitz is now on the Sombra, so he has less to worry about. Only two you on D.Va, right? So now you see that he's just playing super close to the enemy characters. Again, as long as he's able to kind of just hover and potentially go back in the air, he just wants to try to play as close as possible to them so he can hit as many directs as possible. And look at this. Now he's going to play towards this right side again, this famous right side. And he's just going to consistently spam, right? Alright. He gets bomb, conks forward. I would be really surprised if I don't see him try to look for a barrage play potentially on supports. Sometime soon. He looks like he's playing a little bit more defensive. Just playing to shoot whatever kind of goes on cart. Or on the point, sorry. Ah, oh, there's the Augusta barrage that I was looking for. He's able to get two. He's able to get profit from that too. That's exactly <laughs> that's exactly the play that you want to go for. Lucky to be able to hit profit there. But again, you see how he's moving around the map really well too, based off of what the comp is from the enemy team of Soul, right? So I'll pause and I'll kind of quickly talk. So again, looking at these points, whoop, pause this real quick. Okay, we're gonna get out of this and we're gonna kind of just again we're gonna go to a wall so we can see our points a little bit easier. Uh, sure, this wall, uh, that wall doesn't really work. Let's go, right, yeah, this is fine. This works decently well, okay. So to highlight again these points really hard, he is playing terrain quite heavily, especially at the start when he had a lot more kind of counters to him, specifically the McCree kind of came into the light. He was playing the rooftops a lot more, right? He was looking to kind of pop out a little bit, get a few shots out then when he got took a little bit of damage he reduced his hitbox with the roofs and then he looked to kind of go out again right consistently back and forth back and forth never fully committing to being out uh as much as before right because before he could play a little bit more in the open pretty much empty his entire clip then he could look to kind of reduce some, his hitbox a little bit and then go back out right so he you see a little bit of a change up there in terms of how hard or how often he played the train compared to that Koth when he wasn't dealing with as many counters, right? The other thing to keep in mind was his closeness, right? Once those threats were down or once they made those swaps, you saw he wasn't very scared to get close to those uh, enemy heroes, right? He wanted to close that distance and be able to hit those directs a little bit more easily, right? Skybox, not too much. Timing-wise, was very very crucial there as well right you saw that every single time he saw the enemy team go aggressive 
onto the point or onto the back line, he did go for those aggressive plays onto the back line because he understood that two you had to choose. Do you protect your back line or do you go for the front line there, right? So some most of the time you saw that the back line, specifically the supports, were very separated from Tuyu, and he abused that a lot by being able to go for those aggressive plays as they were trying to rotate to save positions, right? So he utilized, again, that terrain to optimize his aggression so he could have really good timing, right? Um, passiveness, again, he started passive in a lot of these fights, right? He was spamming at the start. He was waiting for them to separate a little bit more, then look for his aggressive plays. It's just all about that timing, specifically on rotations, right? And this is where I would say the big thing for timing kind of goes. Rotations is a large part of understanding your timings. It's not just when enemy teams are like engaging or going for fights, right? And I'll put engagements here as well. But these are the times when you want to look to go aggressive. Aside from that, many of the times you're probably going to look to go passive. Because remember, Farah, Farah does a lot of damage spamming just people that are really close together. But she really thrives for taking those one-on-ones or two-on-ones, I should say, because she'll have a pocket uh, and going for those kills. When enemies are rotating, rotating from each other, separating from each other, or going for engagements, because then they're very either far away from each other or they're relatively kind of close to each other, right? And this is where it gets really important with Farah. You saw on the first map, he always was looking to go for those aggressive, aggressive timings if the supports were close enough. Quite a few of the times, supports weren't close enough on the comp there when they're playing against Glads. So it was really hard. He would have to choose to either utilize a lot of his CDs to close the distance. And then even then, True was hitting a lot of sh uh, sleeps there. So it would be a little bit hard to close out those kills. Or he could just look to play a little bit more passive and wait for his opportunity to go for those aggressive plays onto the backline, right? Onto those backline squishies. Uh, and then the rotations again, like I said, right? As Soul, for example, on this map, we're going for rotations to get the point, right? Uh, or go specifically onto the point or force an engagement. The supports were always lagging behind a little bit, right? Because Soul was tr trying to speed up this aggression, this engagement a lot of the times, because they know that they lose the slow game against Hunters, right? That's when Jinmu seized those opportunities and looked to go for those aggressive plays onto the squishies. And they did really, really well with that. Um, and the last thing that I'll kind of talk about is this target selection. I talked about it a little bit more and I said, well, at the start of some of these fights, he's kind of shooting tanks a little bit more, right? Uh, compared to squishies. And what do I mean by that? Even when they're grouped up together, he's shooting tanks a little bit more at the start um, compared to squishies and compared to like looking to shoot more towards the squishies um, perspective. And the reason why, and a big thing that I kind of taught my own Ferris is like this. It's good to go for squishies. Do not get me wrong. But if you're unable to because they're very stacked on your diva or the enemy diva, so she's going to eat a lot of things, there's something that you should do. You should always look to shoot them on pre-engagements. So as they're rotating, as they're taking space, everything before the engagement. Against teams that are very, how am I going to say this? Against teams that are very slow or aren't very fast with their engagement or do not utilize terrain properly on the rotations. So utilize places where they can reduce the amount of spam that they take. Tanks will always be vulnerable, which means they will either have to sacrifice their HP bar, sacrifice big cooldowns like bubble matrix, right? And that is where issues kind of come into light. So that's why in pre-engagements, you want to kind of spam these tanks a little bit more because you can force out their resources a lot, not just because squishies, right? Think about it like this. If you're shooting squishies consistently, yes. For example, a D.Va might want to matrix a little bit, right? So that they can help them cross. But not all the time because squishies can heal each other up, right? Specifically the back line. They can heal each other up and then they can rotate and walk, right? Uh, but if you're consistently shooting the D.Va, for example, before you go into a fight, D.Va has to make a choice. Diva either has to decide, I need to matrix myself so I can keep my high HP in my armor so that when I do go for a dive or when I do walk forward, I have a little bit of matrix, right? Or she has to think to herself, I should maybe matrix right now because I want to make sure that I'm able to close that distance and be at this HP so that when we do dive, I can be a part of this dive for a longer period of time, right? This goes to the same to Winston as well. It's a little bit harder with ball. You can't spam ball as much. But specifically with Winston, right, or Orion, it kind of is the same. They have to make similar choices, right? Winston is, do I do I use my bubble or do I force my diva to matrix me so that I can kind of walk up and take the space uh, a little bit more? Or do I kind of 
tank the damage and just hope I get healed. And then when I go in, I'll have enough HP to survive the dive, right? So when you kind of do that damage in the pre-engagement with Pharah onto tanks, you're forcing them to have to use their abilities a lot more compared to when you're shooting squishies, right? And in terms of that as well, think about space, space management as well. When you're shooting tanks specifically and they're low HP or low CDs, does that make them want to engage on you more when they're low HP or low CDs? Or does that make them feel a little bit less obligated to do that? It makes them feel a little bit less obligated to do those kind of engagements, right? Or to hold space very aggressively. And that's just because of the HP and the low CDs. And this is why it's really strong on these free engagements to shoot tanks. Because then they don't get to execute their play as often. They don't get to take that space. And that's a big part of Overwatch. Taking that space, being able to do stuff when you have that space or as you're trying to contest that space. If you can never do that in the first place, then you're never going to be able to really actually play the game properly, the rest of the team, right? So that's why I think it's really important that you do shoot tanks a little bit more often before engagements even start. Because then you can get them to not even want to start these kind of engagements. And if they're very poor with their CD management, if they're very poor at their pathing where they're always in the open, right, having to utilize their CDs and HP bars, right, then you'll always catch them off guard and be in an advantage even when they are trying to dive you, right. And then in terms of squishies, again, when would I go for squishies? Well, big thing comes into place here with squishies, right. With squishies, it's just all about uh, t -t -t rotations, right. and likely mid fights. Obviously this isn't every single time. Um, this is pretty much like, I would say a constant. So this is a thing that you can consistently look to do. There are outliers all the time in this kind of stuff. But I, whenever I look at play, remember, I look at play for consistency. What do people consistently like to do? What do should people look to consistently try to accomplish, right? Obviously, there will be a time maybe you have a barrage as Jinmu, right? And instead of looking to shoot the tanks on pre-engagement or something, maybe you're going to set up an aggressive barrage onto these squishies on a rotation or before the fight even starts, right? Um, and that's where it kind of differs sometimes, right? So again, like these major points, these things, they always come in. You're seeing them applied a lot, especially in this pre-fight. You see that Jinmu is doing a really good job with the positioning kind of tab and managing his time in the air, right? His timing and his target selection is quite good as well, but where he kind of gets away with himself or a little bit too much is his positioning in these mid-fights, right? What he, his decision-making is going into these mid-fights as well, his aggression, right? 